Hi everyone, Dr. Stephen Cabral here, board certified doctor of naturopathy and integrative health practitioner, looking forward to sharing with you a new update on COVID-19 and really giving you that unbiased perspective of what is working right now and also where we're heading over the next couple of weeks because there is some good news and there's some bad news. So what I want to do is I want to take you through all of this, what it means for typically that everyday person out there that's confused about is the media telling the truth? Is the government telling the truth? Or am I reading on social media? Is any of that true? So I want to share that with you today. I really want to give you a lot of the statistics as well. I want to share with you where we're at right now and uh, what the issues seem to be as to why we're not moving through this virus faster. So I want to share with you first as to why the numbers continue to really grow. So right now on today's April 7th, we're at about 1.4 million cases worldwide. Now, one of the biggest issues as to why this continues to grow is that the United States is doing a very poor job at controlling the spread of uh, COVID-19 cases. Now, there's many reasons for this. One is because really New York has been inundated with the spread and a massive amount of cases. But the second is that, and just as important, is that the United States has done the worst job at testing people. And those people that they were testing, it took them seven to 12 days to get test results back. So we did a really poor job of testing. We only tested those people that had symptoms. And because of that, it allowed uh, the spread to happen a lot faster. So that's one of the biggest issues. You have to keep in mind that the United States right now is double any other country, and we don't have all of the largest, like we don't have the largest country, right? We do have 300 plus million people here. But even if you were to take, let's say the UK, for example, the UK didn't do a great job, but they did an okay job. They did a decent job. But let me just share with you how much better it was in the United States. They have, uh, what, about 60 million people or so, I believe, in the UK. And they had about 55,000 cases. And when we look at that, over um, what that would mean to the U.S., they, they did a better job by more than double. You know, so what I'm saying is that almost every country, Spain did a poor job, Italy did a poor job, there's no doubt about it. In the very begin beginning, China did a poor job. We don't know if China's reporting the correct statistics or not, but if they are, then them, along with South Korea and many other countries, have pretty much stopped the spread of this virus. Now, they were about three weeks to four weeks ahead of the United States. And that's why I do want to share with you that what we're looking at right now, and this is based on very specific statistics that are being updated on a daily basis, but they really haven't changed over the last week or so. So again, we have to do a better job with lab testing. We need to lab test more people because the thought process is also that, sure, the numbers are about 1.4 million people with confirmed cases, but most experts believe it's five to 10 times that minimum. That means, well, there's good and bad to that. That means that there's probably something more like 14 million people, right, in the United States, well, actually globally, and I believe it's probably well beyond that, um, that, uh, that do have COVID-19 or had it, and they just had mild symptoms. And again, that's because 80% of people will exhibit something like no symptoms at all to mild symptoms such as a headache, feeling a little run down, a little fatigued, or maybe even just a mild fever or cough. So, and then of course, then we have the people that are going to express a larger uh, uh, ex exhibition of those symptoms, and those are the people that we need to help the most. So, Let's go back and let's actually talk about what those peaks are. So this is this is true, unbiased, non-media based hype. The peak in the United States, which is uh, about probably the middle to end of the COVID nineteen curve. So meaning that um, Australia will be will be behind the United States, but most people will be following along with the United States, um, such as those in Western Europe, and a lot of people. Um, in the East will have already gotten their majority of their cases. So right now we're looking at the exact peak when the most hospital beds will be needed is actually April 15th. Okay, April 15th. Now, the largest amount of mortality we will see in a given day will be um, about the next day after, but about April 16th or so, and then we'll start to see that drop. Now, I want to give you the exact drops. So I'm going to pull up my health data 
Uh, again, everything's being taken from John Hopkins University. It's being taken from healthdata.org. Like these are unbiased uh, and collaborated, um, collaborated, collaborated based websites. So just to share with you this, um, April 15th, uh, somewhere between the 13th and 15th, we're looking at the peak, okay? So at that time, we'll need anywhere from about 70,000 beds, 73,000 beds, to about 284,000 beds. It's a big gap, right? But what we're estimating is about 140,000 beds will be needed. That's where it comes in. In terms of ICU beds, so less, of course, but more severe, somewhere around 29,000 beds. And ventilators needed, about 25,000, okay? So that's our peak, that is what we're trying to do. The whole point of people social distancing and quarantining, staying inside, has not been because of the uh, severity of this virus for the majority of people. We know that it's when everything shakes out, it'll be far less than 1% of the population. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about it. And that's because way more people got COVID-19 that, that they're even estimating. And about the, the number of um, people that COVID-19... Um, uh, caused deaths in are about 50% was 75 years and older, which again, th these are not good statistics. I'm not saying that at all, but we know now more of that data coming in. And I'm going to share with you in just a few moments. We only need about another week to two weeks maximum to know what the best life-saving treatments will be as well. So that will coincide right with a peak. And that's, that's good timing. In my opinion, that is good timing. So then though, we see a huge drop. We see a drop of about, let's see, um, about 33% by April 23rd. So just about a week later, we see a drop to 100,000, 150,000, 100,000 in terms of beds needed. And then by May 1st, we see a 60% drop from our peak around April 15th. And then uh, essentially by the end of May, uh, by June 1st, we see almost zero. We see about 1,000 beds or so. We see very, very low. Very, I mean, that's over the entire United States. So it's very low. So June goes way back to the same stats as essentially uh, the beginning of March when, when this was not uh, talked about as much. So what I'm optimistic about is that we are going in the next week or two, we're going to have the life-saving drugs for those people that need it the most with the uh, difficulty breathing, the inflammation built up in the lungs from the COVID-19 uh, receptors or the lung-based receptors actually picking and drawing and connecting with the um, COVID-19 uh, itself, the virus itself. And I won't get into the, whether viruses are alive. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. I'm going to go over a lot of that probably next week. I'll be separating like fact from fiction and, and 5G and um, a lot of the other things. And just keep in mind that this virus is real. Viruses are, I don't want to get too deep into it today. They're not alive outside the body, but they are fractionated segments of DNA and they are bound with the lipid membrane. And when they do enter the body, well, then they do become activated and they do have a host then. It's almost like a parasite and they do live. And so this is a real thing and we do need to take it seriously. Now, there has been a massive over-exaggeration in the media. I just saw today, um, headline says, 12,000 more body bags needed for, um, you know, Chicago. And I just said, this is, this is just promoting fear. And whether that is true or not true, that doesn't seem to be true at all based on these statistics and based on the mortality rate. But even if that were true, uh, spreading that type of fear to people just to increase rating, absolutely deplorable. I hope that people remember this. This is one of the biggest things about COVID-19. Many of us are learning a lot about ourselves, our family, our livelihoods, how important health is to us. But we also have to remember, please keep in mind all of the people that spread fear. Please keep their names in mind. I am never one to disparage another person, and you don't have to say anything negative about them, but tune those people out in the future. They do not have a place in our society. Fear, mongering, and, and really uh, promoting that type of panic is uncalled for. It's completely uncalled for. For a lot of those people, very well educated, uh, that the media latched onto saying that 40 to 70% of the population would be infected and that it would be over a billion deaths. I mean, come on. I mean, we don't need to scare people like that, especially with things that are categorically untrue and just hypothesized at that time. So this is very serious that we should be uh, absolutely uh, stopping the spread of this, especially just to keep up with hospital beds. But let's let's keep the truth the truth. Um, the estimated deaths for COVID-19 
will be somewhere around 80,000 or so potentially uh, in the United States, potentially uh, about a quarter uh, million people worldwide in the United States. The 2000 17, 2018 flu was about the same, about 80,000 people. 2018, 19 was about 70,000, I believe. And last year's was about 40,000. So this is more dangerous than the flu. And the symptoms come on faster. It's also happening in a condensed period of time, which makes this far more dangerous for hospitals. But again, most hospitals are not inundated. Please also keep that in mind. That is not a truth. New York, absolutely inundated. That is true. But we have to just, we want to separate fact from fiction so that we can also understand what we need to be doing. Now, for right now in the news, or not in the news, that, that is working, hydroxychloroquine, also pronounced hydroxychloroquine, uh, seems to be working along with azithromycin. Okay, that's most MDs and most um, specialists go to. Remdesivir and a few of the others are working. Please go back to my previous videos. They're all at stephencabral.com forward slash virus, since I'm not going to go through all of those today. Okay, that's in previous videos. Why are they working? Well, it's hypothesized. Remember, over 50% of all pharmaceuticals are idiopathic in the, in the way that they work. So that means we don't exactly know how they work, except that we know that we do get the intended result. So when we're looking at a uh, autoimmune-based drug like hydroxychloroquine, uh, is that we're able to see that it helps with autoimmune issues that are Th1 dominant, such as a rheumatoid arthritis or a Hashimoto's or lupus, something like that, Plaquenil psoriasis. Okay, so why do they work? Well, they help stop the exaggeration of a cytokine expression of Th1 dominance. That means that there's an over-exaggeration of the immune system. Now, I believe there's an underlying root cause, especially when we know that 90% of all autoimmune issues have gut-based issues as part of its root cause. Anyway, that's another separate video. So they could help with this suppression of the greater exaggeration of the immune system, which would then allow for less inflammation. So that's one reason. The second possible reason is that it helps with an uptake of zinc at a tissue level, and zinc stops the replication of viruses, and it helps the immune system function to a greater degree. The third reason is that it may change the pH level at a tissue level, not the blood level, but a tissue level, and a higher pH solution has been proven to not allow for the... Um, expression or replication of viruses. Again, not a blood level, which is the um, pH of about 7.356, but actually the tissue level, which can be higher. So those are some potential reasons. Um, and then we know that azithromycin may work for uh, multiple reasons, maybe some of those as well with zinc uptake, but we know that it helps with secondary-based infections as well. And we know pneumonia could be uh, a bacterial-based issue, and that's helping with that as well. Okay, so just a couple other things to touch on. Again, I gave you the timeline based on what the experts are saying. And um, also a new drug that's being looked at. It is APN01. Check this out. APN01, uh, human recumbent soluble angiotensin converting enzyme 2. That is what we're working on. We are working on the, in, we're basically trying to block uh, this COVID-19 strain of uh, a coronavirus from actually attaching to the particular cells where it will then be allowed to thrive and create the most inflammation. So check out APN01 uh, in the future. I'm hoping, optimistic, but also I, I know that it's not scalable, but plasma-based therapy, absolutely fantastic. Finding the people that had COVID-19, which is why we need more lab testing, the healthy people will take their blood, will use their antibodies to actually fight off the um, virus in the body. We know vitamin C works. We know zinc works. We know vitamin D works. Uh, we know melatonin works. Check out stephencabral.com forward slash virus for previous videos on the dosage to take and how they are working. Okay. Uh, I talked about the peak. I talked about quarantining. I believe that quarantining will still take place all the way through the first week of May. I'm hoping that we can get people back to work at that point. Um, hopefully our younger people, healthier people, and those people that are immunocompromised, those people 65 plus, or those people that are most at risk, they should still continue, uh, in my opinion, to um, social distance just for a bit longer until we get to about mid-May. And then I'm optimistic. Uh, I want everybody return to return to happy, uh, healthy life. And of course, I still want you to be boosting your immune system, right? Following the de-stress protocol. And again, that was in the very first video at stephencabral.com forward slash virus.
So that's it. I will provide more videos each and every week. Next week, probably doing a lot of myth busting, but also if I need to, I'll take precedence over the best conventional medicine, the best uh, naturopathic medicine that is working. I wish you all well. I really do. I'm happy to answer your comments and questions. Um, and again, if there's anything that I can do, please do feel free to let me know. I'm here to help. Take care. Be well.